be presenting today uh, focuses on the intersections of popular music, the media, and information technologies in contemporary Cuba. In particular, I'm interested in the ways the gradual domestication of uh, information and communication technologies has made possible the independent production uh, and distribution of music, which has contributed to the democratization of the cultural public sphere and has provided space for underprivileged social groups to be here. Uh, this process has not developed uncontested, hence I will give attention um, to the cultural and political responses coming from the Cuban state, the official media, and the intellectual elite. Within the larger um, social shaping framework and with roots in media and anthropology, domestication theory explores the ways information and communication technologies are appropriated by its users, initially stressing how they were fitted into the household. Yet, this theory allows us to ask broader questions about how technologies are incorporated and used creatively within a community. Uh, so this paper takes this framework as a starting point to explore the various implications of the domestication of information technologies by Cuban musicians. Over the years, the Cuban state has granted a great importance to the realm of information, communication, and discourse. The early control over the media achieved during the first years of the revolution and the tight control over all fields of cultural production in general uh, point to an awareness of the decisive role of controlling public opinion, our opinion and information. Hence, political goals and ideological frameworks have become embedded on policy making concerning technologies and so at the same time, the government uh, imposes ICTs, learning programs, and has bought computers for every school in the country. Uh, the penetration rate of the internet is one of the lowest in uh, Latin America. In general, the model of internet development and appropriation in the country is explained and justified through a social use thesis, uh, which attempts to make compatible and acceptable at the discursive level the need to use the internet can you hear? Okay. It's loud, that's all. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying because there's someone chatting like in the other room. Um, so trying to make compatible um, the, the imperative to control the internet as a communication technology, but at the same time a source of alternative information for individuals. Um, and this is true for other information uh, and communication technologies such as DVDs, printers, mobile phones, I will skip an overview of the internet in Cuba uh, just to stress two things. One, that the model of control shifting from a direct state control to an apparent market control in the sense that there is now a bit more access but only for the most affluent. And I say apparent because this is actually uh, a result of a state policy and not a result of, of a free market. And the second is that historically all this regulation has fed a booming black market where computers, and parts uh, could be acquired. So the gradual uh, penetration of music technologies in the country has provided musicians with new quotes of independence. So for instance, it's trovadores such as Carlos Varela and Fran de Gauss in the 90s has to produce uh, their records abroad. Now, uh, contestatory uh, rap groups such as Los Aldeanos can make their music in a home studio. And similarly, Critical uh, to the developing of the reggaeton scene in Cuba was the emergence of an informal uh, music economy, boosted by the relative increased availability of uh, technologies such, such as MP3, CD players, and most hip hop and reggaeton have been produced in home based studios and distributed by street sellers. I want to highlight here that music piracy is not prosecuted in Cuba. Actually, it, it was legalized. I mean, selling music CDs on the street has been legalized as one of that, uh, one of those uh, self-employment activities, um, which are now legal. No? So currently, the quality, for, for instance, of reggaeton recordings have improved uh, because many of these music producers uh, that tour abroad, they bought the computer and, and the, all the technology abroad, and of course, they use a lot of uh, uh, pirate software to produce this music. And audiovisual technologies and the development of an independent filmmaking movement has also boosted reggaeton and many other music genres in Cuba. 
Um, the diffusion of reggaeton in the capital increased due to the reproduction of, for example, video clips on uh, TVs, uh, these new flat TVs in these uh, private cafeterias and restaurants, and also on, on uh, white screens, on parties, or concerts organized by new, uh, new music show companies such as PMM. And the circulation of these audiovisuals, and this is very interesting, in these informal networks, it's so potent that many of these musicians do not produce uh, video clips for the official media anymore. So, for instance, Os Osmani Garcia, which is a very well-known uh, reggaetonero, he has a team of uh, fil a filmmaking team that follows him everywhere, and they film what they call reality shows, uh, and they post it on, on the web, on, on his own website and on YouTube. And uh, and he says that for him, that makes him even more more popular. And but despite uh, the internet limitations, that was. Uh, talking about uh, Cuba-based musicians and producers also use try to use the internet and social media to promote their activities and construct new markets abroad. Uh, since musicians' most important sources of income are not records in Cuba but live performances, uh, either abroad or in local venues with a hard, uh, with entrance fees in hard currency, these tours abroad are fundamental to economically sustain their activity. And many of these websites have been built by fans, communities, or foreign entrepreneurs, and musicians hold little control of them. The fact that many musicians, especially from the underground, do not have access to the internet in Cuba creates further paradoxes. For instance, this is a, a post in YouTube, one of the oldest posts of uh, a video uh, entitled La Naranja Se Pico, which is very contestatory, uh, contestatory very critical. And it has like more than two million hits. But when I interview one of the members of this rap group, he told me that I have no idea what internet is. And uh, yeah, I'd rather when I'm a road, I, I do other stuff, but I have no idea what internet is. But overall, uh, I think the gradual domestication of information uh, techno and communication technologies. Um, has resulted in new actors coming to play in the cultural field. Currently, the means of cultural production no longer exclusively lie on the hands of cultural or political elites. And this is certainly, uh, this creates a new scenario characterized by social heteroglossia, in which dissenting or alternative voices from the bottom up are heard loudly in the streets, taxis, schools, and other public places. From troubadours to filmmakers and academics, they all agree that in the context of media censorship in Cuba, the arts and cultural practices in general have replaced the official media in promoting necessary debate, thus functioning as what I call cultural public spheres. In dialogue with Haberman's theory, Ajit McGigan stresses that the current popular engagement with the public sphere usually takes an affective mode rather than a purely rational one. Hence, he develops this notion of cultural public sphere. And sometimes these spheres are highly poli uh, politicized. From throw to rap, there is a strong tradition of social commentary and dissent in contemporary Cuban popular music. For example, you know, the words of throw is social calvarela, the rappers Rosaldianos, the rock band Porno para Ricardo. However, popular music not only carves alternative or oppositional spaces, but also constitutes a cultural public sphere where apparently non-political topics are linked to a broader discussion on key matters such as nationalism, racism, racism, economics, and the future of the country. It is also decided to negotiate global and local identities and to play with other capitalist values, aspirations, and identities. And this is the case of reggaeton, for instance. Elsewhere, I have analyzed the connections of reggaeton with the Cuban underclass and emerging values of consumerism that challenge the hegemony of socialist values. And a reggaeton emerged closely, close to socially, economically, and politically marginalized youth, mainly black, who found in reggaeton, among other things, a job opportunity. And one of the main reasons this gender has been so criticized because of its insistence on money, compensatory consumption, and class distinction. So, Consequently, over the years, the Cuban state has deployed a variety of strategies to counteract this type of critical music or music that does not fit the official definition of proper 
um, politically correct culture. Um, bureaucracy is a basic one. There's a, a system of artistic, artistic agencies controlled by the Ministry of Culture that provides musicians with the work, permissions, the permissions to travel. And so this is a, a, a first gate. Uh, other strategies involve, for example, direct censorship um, or policies of strong marginalization. An extreme example was the recent uh, detention of Gorky Aguila, for instance, the leader of the contest contestatory punk rock band Porno para Ricardo, uh, to stop the release of the independently produced album Maleconazo Ahora. Uh, in an interview with uh, one of the rappers of Los Aldeanos, for instance, he told me that after they toured to Miami and re uh, returned to the country, they were banned from all public venues. I mean, they, they are not allowed to uh, perform in public in Cuba anymore. Um, in many occasions, censorship is coupled with strategies of assimilation or cultural appropriation. The process where whereby the culture practices which threaten to disrupt the status quo are attended to and transformed through direct intervention by elites with the end of diffusing their social transformative power. And this is something that Sujata Fernandez in his work on hip hop has already noticed. And it's a very complex process in which, yeah, musicians try to negotiate with official don in search for support and this comes with some surprise because the state controls all the public venues to perform. So I'm, I'm going to finish with uh, the case of uh, Rodilla, of Rodilla Festival. It's a very interesting case study in relation to what I've been talking about. Um, one, of the, one of the outcomes of the domestication of music technologies is the flourishing of uh, electronic music, as it, called in Cuba, as it is called in Cuba, although with much more or less popularity than reggaeton, this music has built a niche of mostly white, urban, young audiences coming together around parties and festivals, uh, such as the Rodilla Festival, which was shut down in 2011, after it reached 20,000 participants. Uh, the festival started in 1998 and gathered DJs, musicians, and fans during three days in a beach uh, nearby uh, Havana. I'm going to show you a like, short clip so you have a sense what was this Rodilla Festival. control of the festival, but from the beginning the issue of autonomy brought frictions with authorities, as the Matraca group itself documented in the film Ni Bush Ni Nadie, which I will show you shortly. Uh, and the title refers to the Sila and Caribbean paradox Ted was talking about in his paper, uh, the fact that bloggers and musicians as well have to struggle against both state and foreign control to keep their legitimacy. And this would happen. It's what happened in one of their tours. Salimos a la Habana, vamos directo por toda la autopista hasta Santiago de Río. Después 
with authorities and how they wanted to shut down one of their tours and how the, there was even a, a meeting at the Central Committee of the Communist Party. And so the guys were, they were really surprised that for a festival there was a meeting at that high rank. So one, because one respect that electronic music with no discursive content or lyric whatsoever could be easily accommodated as part of the booming alternative music scene in Cuba. However, such insistence in the autonomy and keeping control of the festival, for example, in terms of who was invited, uh, and they invited rappers uh, uh, like Los Aldeanos, and also the fact that the event was growing so rapidly, attracting foreign press attention and gathering thousands of young Cubans, uh, turns the festival into a problem. So in 2011, the authorities just decided to keep uh, the festival going, but with other name, with another name, and remove the organization from Matraca's hands, and invite less controversial, uh, less controversial uh, musicians. Um, so the group denounced on the internet what they consider as plagiarism and steal of their work, and uh, the officialist website La Jiribilla had to reply with an interview with the director of culture in Mayabeque, which is now well, they call one of those provinces in, in Cuba, denying that authorities were at war with Matraca and uh, that Verano in Hibagoa was not a copy of Rodilla. Um, yet his declarations also suggest other concerns, as you can see in the slide. They were mainly concern, uh, concerned about the autonomy and the fact that the festival was not organized through the institutions, the official institutions. So most of the time, political rejection is presented as a matter of uh, moral and cultural values, conservation or, of traditions or threats to natural culture. In this sense, the new wave of moral panic triggered, triggered by reggaeton in Cuba not only reveals states' revolt at the hints of vulgarity in popular culture, but its fears of the transgression of cultural regulation and the dangerous blur of boundaries of high and low culture. Yet, I argue that behind the moral panic against reggaeton, uh, there is a re projection to a new type of social and political subject, which is clearly disconnected from social values, and which has made it into the public sphere without permission. So the state has reacted with a new attempt to explicitly regulate music and its social use. And this was announced by the president of the Cuban Institute of Music. Um, there are still no public details of this regulation, but it seems to be directed towards controlling the music played at the media and state venues, including schools. But we have to wait and see if an official ban of, of reggaeton uh, will be able to, uh, you know, to completely regulate uh, this genre because this genre occurs and takes uh, place mainly in an informal. Uh, network. So, how to weigh the political potential or impacts of the processes of music creation and distribution this goes so far? Well, it can be argued that the democratization allowed by technologies has fostered a democratization of the cultural public sphere in Cuba. The central issue here is that the state uh, has lost uh, control over independent cultural production, which certainly poses new challenges to our regime so far used to monopolize the cultural field. Through the omnipresent, uh, omnipresent reggaeton and other genres such as hip hop, the lower classes have reached an increasing visibility in the cultural public sphere to the point of making state culture policies centered on high art to appear obsolete. Sometimes consciously, some others not, musicians are using technology to disseminate oppositional messages or conflictive values such as consumerism. They have come together to independently produce music, audiovisuals, shows, and festivals. And in this scenario, the government is finding problematic to control the cultural public sphere and bottom-up collective uh, creation of cultural content. 
Censorship attempts are usually fought back by performance and uh, by performance and made public via the internet and the social media. So authorities have to at least be prepared to be questioned and give some sort of response, such as the, the Rodilla case show. Uh, so from Manolab to Ateroglossia, it seems technology is helping to change the rules of the cultural field in Cuba. Uh, 